Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be solving a nice exponential equation. We have square root of 10 plus 3 to the power x plus square root of 10 minus 3 to the power x equals 38. And we're going to be solving for x values. How many solutions are there? Are there any solutions? Something to think about, right? Let's go ahead and find out. So when you have an equation, an exponential equation, and there's only one base, and the variable is an exponent, like something like a to the power x equals b, then these equations are actually pretty easy to solve. Why? You can log both sides and then just go from there, because our goal is to solve for x. Remember, x is the unknown. But what if you have two different bases, like a to the power x and b to the power x, even though the exponents are the same, the bases are different, and we get their sum. So on the right-hand side, it doesn't matter. It's just going to be a constant. Let's call that C. How do you solve an equation like this? A to the X plus B to the X equals C. Well, if A and B are related, such as, let's say, A is 4, B is 2, then related basically means, or maybe I should call it relatable, 4 can be written as 2 to the second power, right? So we can kind of associate these two bases. But what if one of them is a 2, the other one is a 3, and right-hand side is a constant, then you can kind of look at, at it this way. The left-hand side is going to be an increasing function, depending on a and b values, of course, or maybe decreasing. And then uh, right-hand side is kind of like a horizontal line, and they can only intersect at a single point, because one of them is always increasing or decreasing, and therefore one-to-one, -one, so on and so forth, right? So there's a lot of different scenarios. But what if a and b do not seem to be related, such as 2 and 4, or 4 and 8. Even 2 square root of 2 and 8 are related because they, they, both of these can be written as powers of 2. Make sense? And fractional powers uh, or rational powers are also included. In this case, we have a different scenario because they don't seem to be related. So let's say you have something like this. Okay, maybe I can do the following. Suppose you have an equation like this. Let me give you an example. Suppose this is equal to 5. You, you can immediately tell x is equal to 1, right? Obviously. But nothing else satisfies it because this is an increasing function and this is constant. So there can only be one solution. But what if one of them is like 2 to the power x and the other one is 1 over 3 to the power x? This is increasing, that's decreasing. That's a very different scenario. So you kind of need to consider incre uh, in increasing and decreasing intervals. You kind of have to look at the derivatives and so on and so forth. Anyways, those are different scenarios, but... Let's take a look at these two bases. How do you find an association uh, between these two bases? That's a good question, right? First of all, notice that these are complex, not complex, I mean, these are radical conjugates, right? What does that mean? Whenever you have something like square root of a plus the square root of b and the square root of a minus the square root of b, those are called conjugates. Why are they called conjugates? Because when you multiply them, you get a real number. Especially if you have something like square root of 10 plus 3 and square root of 10 minus 3 because square root of b is an integer, things are even better. So what happens if you take two conjugates and multiply from difference of two squares, you get rid of the radicals, which is what is nice about these scenarios. And with this one, when you multiply these two things, not only you get a rational or real number, but you also get something super nice. What is square root of 10 squared and 3 squared? It's 10 minus 9, which is 1. Great. You know what that means? It means these are not just conjugates, but they are also reciprocals. Is that nice? So since this times this is 1, we can actually divide both sides by one of these. Like how about dividing both sides by root 10 plus 3, and do it on both sides, and then you'll get this. So this shows you that, okay, these two expressions are reciprocals. Make sense? Cool. So now we have the following. How can we use this? Here's the idea. You can go ahead and replace square root of 10 minus 3 with 1 over square root of 10 plus 3, so that we can get the same base eventually. Let's go ahead and write it down. I'm going to show you how to get there square root of 10 plus 3 to the power x, and then the second expression will be replaced by 1 over square root of 
10 plus 3, and I'm going to raise the whole thing to the power x, and the sum is equal to 38. This might still look complicated and maybe difficult, but don't worry, we'll get there. Notice that the reciprocal of a number can be written as that number to the power negative 1. What am I talking about? a to the power negative 1 is the same as 1 over a, or vice versa, right? Both ways. So now we can go ahead and do the following. Replace 1 over square root of 10 plus 3 with square root of 10 plus 3 to the power negative 1. And the net negative 1 is a power will be multiplied by x, and that will give you negative x. Is that okay? I hope I didn't skip too many steps. Just one. Okay. So in other words, I'm basically saying that, okay, this can be written as this to the power negative 1. When you raise it to the power x, you're going to multiply the exponents, and negative 1 times x is negative x. Make sense? Now, this is really nice. You know why? Because I can use substitution. But wait a minute. What does this mean? A negative power. Okay. Actually, you didn't have to do that because you could also write this as follows. I probably took an unnecessary step, but anyways, I can write it like this because 1 to the power x is always 1. So I can write it like this and I could directly go from here. Definitely, right? And this equals 38. So what are we going to do with this? Great. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to use substitution, and this is just going to work nicely. Let's go ahead and call this something. How about y? And don't question y. This gives us y plus 1 over y equals 38. Multiply everything by y. y squared plus 1 equals 38y. And then bring the 38 over here. 38y plus 1 equals 0. Awesome. Where do we go from here? The quadratic formula, right? Can we do anything else? Probably not. And uh, one thing you can probably think about is what kind of y do I need so that when I add them, the radical part cancels out? Because y is definitely some type of radical, right? You're going to raise a radical to a power, an integer power, hopefully, and then you'll get another radical. So you add two radicals, but then you get a rational number. How is that possible? the radical parts need to cancel out, just like complex numbers. When you add a plus bi and a minus bi, what happens is the imaginary parts cancel out. Just like that, you can think of this as a plus b root c and a minus b root c. So when you add them, the radicals will cancel out. Make sense? Okay, so you can go that way. So it's going to be like 19 plus minus something. And the reason why it's 19 is because we're going to split 38 into half. Okay, or cut in half, in other words. So let's use the quadratic formula, negative b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. That's going to be minus 4 all over 2. Now, how do you simplify 38 squared minus 4? That's a good question. You could probably factor it using difference of two squares because think about it. This can be written as 38 squared minus 2 squared, and that is 38 minus 2 times 38 plus 2. And guess what? This is super helpful. You know why? Because now 38 minus 2 is a perfect square, and this is just 40. Isn't that amazing? That's just perfect, right? So now let's go ahead and replace it with that. And what you can do is take out 36, but not only that, you could also take out a 4. So 36 times 4, like this, will be 6 times 2, which is 12. So I'm going to take out a 12, and then inside, I'm going to have a 10 left, which is nice because our expression also contains a square root of 10 or radical 10, which is good. Now, divide everything by 2, you're going to get 19 plus minus 6 root 10. Didn't I tell you? The rational part is going to have a 19 in it because you have to add them. Think about it. Take these two expressions, add them, you're going to get 38. Make sense? We, we add them and we get 38, but they are something to the power x. So how do we go from here to x? Let's go ahead and take a look. So I'll take square root of 10 plus 3 to the power x, and I want it to be 19 plus minus 6 root 10. Now here's a million dollar question. Can I take a radical with a plus sign and get something as, with a minus sign? No way, right? So this uh, the signs need to match. So I'm going to go with the plus sign on both. So my goal is to... Can I find x from here? And absolutely. I mean, you can log both sides. And when you log both sides, you're going to get something like this. 
and then eventually using properties of logarithms, you can move the x to the front and divide both sides by that. So to keep a long story short, x is going to be the following. But the million dollar question is, what is this equal to? How do you simplify it, right? So in order to be able to do that, we need to be able to write this as a power of that. And that's what the whole thing is all about. Look, root 10 plus 3 to the power of what number equals 19 plus 6 root 10? Notice that this is greater than 1. So if I can find the x value, it's going to be unique because the left-hand side is increasing, right-hand side is a constant. Does that make sense? We always use that idea. So I'm just going to guess. Given that 19 can be made from 10 plus 9, this tells me, okay, x equals 2 seems to work. And it actually does, because if you square this number, then you get this. Think about it. Let's break it down a little bit. So this will be root 10 squared plus 3 squared plus 2ab is going to give you that. This is 19 and bingo, we got it, right? So x equals 2 is a solution, but guess what? Is that the only solution? That will be a good question. And then you can kind of think about it this way. If x equals something is a solution, its opposite is also going to be a solution. Why? Because in this case, you replace x with 2, but you might as well replace x with negative 2 because then it'll be satisfied. Make sense? Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at the results from well, from alpha. First of all, there's a graph. Uh-oh. There seems to be two solutions, right? We just talked about it. And then Wolfram Alpha gives us the following. Unfortunately, it cannot give us, can it? Let's go ahead and find out more details. And ta-da, yes, it can give us complex solutions as well, but no real solutions in the simplest form. So unfortunately, Wolfram Alpha fails to simplify this expression. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then. Be safe, take care, and bye-bye.